community Rodrigo Cano here and I just want to take a quick moment to share with you how God continues to use microchurches. As of right now, 
we have more than 135 micro churches that are part of Community Christian Church. Some of them are here locally in the United States, but some of them are international, places like Uganda and Cuba and Pakistan and Kenya and in India. God, for some reason, continues to, to grow our impact in India, particularly in India. Ambassador Coley has been doing a great, great job of multiplying leaders and networks and churches, microchurches, now more than 87 microchurches just in India. God is doing some amazing things. Uh, as of our last conversation with Pastor Coley, he has been able to baptize more than 200 people, 270 U plus conversations just this year. God is doing some amazing things and God continues to open doors for us to train leaders here locally and also internationally to help more and more people find their way back to God. And community, that's what it means to be the church. Hello and welcome to Community Online. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Here at Community, we are all about helping people find their way back to God. This mission is the heartbeat behind everything we do. We believe the life you are longing for can be found in a growing connection with God, the church, and the world God's given us to love and serve, and we wanna help you experience that life. If you're interested in learning more, drop us a comment and we'll be sure to connect with you. If you're new here, I want to say a special welcome. By joining us today, you've already taken your first step, and we'd love to help you take your next steps. To do that, scan the QR code to check in and create your account so we can learn your name and reach out. Or feel free to say, hey, in the chat or submit a prayer request. We would love to connect with you. One of the things you're giving supports here at Community is the effort to launch micro churches in Chicagoland and throughout the world. But I'm sure many of you are wondering, what is a micro church? And I'm glad you asked. Micro churches are small but full expressions of community happening in homes, online, and in public spaces. Normally, somewhere between 10 to 50 people. I'd love to show you one of those micro churches that's currently meeting in India. This is the sign-in sheet from one of their recent gatherings. It's a bit surreal seeing our church name at the top. It's a reminder that these people don't see themselves as a small group or as an online attenders of a church in Chicagoland. No, they are a living, breathing church committed to helping people find their way back to God. And I want you to notice the numbers in the middle of the sheet. Each member of the microchurch estimates out how many people they are connected to and have influence with. And from there, the church estimates what their potential impact is when it comes to sharing Jesus outside their church. Do you see that bottom number? This microchurch network has the ability to impact 10,000 people in remote parts of India with the gospel of Jesus. Yes, you heard me right, 10,000 people. When you give here at Community, you are playing an active part in helping plant microchurches in India and throughout the world. So I encourage you to join me in giving generous as we give back to God. You can give online or set up your recurring gift by going to givenow.cc or by texting the word GIVE to 331-226-1686. As you give, let's get ready to continue in our series, The Wise Way. When is the last time you received a really great compliment? I hope it's not been long at all, but my hunch is that there is a shortage of compliments in our world, so we sent someone out to try and remedy the problem. You know, a sincere compliment can go a long way. I should know, it's kept me out of the big house quite a few times. Hey, I'm just a regular guy, but I'm a wise guy. The name's Cam, Cam Flament. It's not just my name, it's what I do. Check this out. Your laughter is contagious. Keep it up. And a good day to you, sir. City of Broad Shoulders, you got them right there. Can I say the pink motif? It works. Enjoy your day. Keep working it. You're doing great. Nobody else got the memo, huh? You're looking good, sir. Good day to you, ladies. I love the chartreuse. 
It's perfect for this time of summer. Oh, I love the green. It's a beautiful pop of color in a drab city. You have a remarkable ability to move forward through space without looking up. Where do you get your shoes shined, my friend? This is how they come. Hey, all right. Hey, they nice, make them man. different these days, hey, don't they? Nice. Ah, thanks, you too, you too. I love the pastels and the color scheme. Well, thank you so much. Look at this bird. I like the board. This, what is that? Some kind of futuristic uh, travel machine? What is this? Back in 88. 88. Kind of like back to the future, if you know what I mean. Well, yes, the flux capacitor. It's the thing that makes time travel possible. Exactly. I know. Yeah. I've heard of it. Well, carry on with your day. You look great. You look like you feel great. You deserve it. I appreciate that. Enjoy. Thank you. You have a marvelous weight distribution between your feet, sir. Thank you. Oh, there's no crying in Chicago. You didn't hear? But you got a great cry. Don't let anybody take that away from you. Never ceases to amaze me how much a compliment can brighten a person's day. I mean, just appreciating the little things that they did to go out into the world. It's remarkable, really. I love the creativity of those compliments. And where did they find that guy? Compliment? What a great name. You know, a university professor did a series of studies in which he did brain scans on both compliment givers and compliment receivers. And he found that kind words are so powerful that the giver of the compliment experiences all the same positive benefits as the person receiving the compliment. Words make a big impact. In fact, words create worlds. We see it first with our Heavenly Father, who set creation in motion with the phrase as simple as, let there be light. And in 1776, Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, and he set forth the birth of our nation. And in 1961, when John F. Kennedy publicly committed to landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade, the technology did not actually exist to get us there. But Kennedy understood that words create worlds, and he leveraged their power to move us forward. And this isn't just true of major historical events. Words create worlds in your life. Think of the way your life changed when you heard these words. You're hired. Congratulations, you've been accepted. Will you marry me? You rocked it. See, this is completely true for me. I was in my mid-30s, deep into a career in music that I thought I would do forever. And then a spiritual leader in my life asked a question. He said, have you ever considered becoming a pastor? And in that moment, the answer was no, but it put in motion a series of conversations and prayers that ultimately changed my life. Words are spoken and career paths are forged and relationships are built and talents are discovered. But of course, the worlds created by words aren't always good realities. You know that if you've ever heard these words. You're fired. We regret to inform you. I want a divorce. You ruined it. You see, with just a few subtle word changes, all that can be built can also be undone. Our culture is out of control with damaging words. The internet offers this sense of anonymity in which we can say anything we want without feeling the effect. So people have become outspoken and critical. We've gotten mean. Evan Williams, one of the creators of Twitter, he said, I thought once everybody could speak freely and exchange information and ideas, the world was automatically going to be a better place. I was wrong about that. Being casual with words online has made it easier to be casual with words in everyday life, and the result is a confusing and fragmented and destructive world. But it doesn't have to be this way. God invites us to walk the wise way. And one of the ways we do that is by taking notice of the incredible power of our words. So in our current series, we're digging into the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs is meant to be a book of wisdom. Uh, the bulk of it is short, punchy, memorable, and sticky sayings to help you face decisions in your daily life. The core argument of Proverbs is this. Life involves choices between two different ways, the foolish way and the wise way. And Proverbs leads us in the way of wisdom. 
Last week, we learned the wise way begins with fear of the Lord. And this fear doesn't mean being terrified of God. Rather, it's having reverence, respect, awe for Him. This heart posture recognizes God's wisdom is greater than our own and involves submitting to His instruction and seeking to honor Him with our lives. However, the wise way doesn't stop with heart posture. Wisdom is also a skill, something we can learn. To walk in the wise way requires effort and practice. One of the most repeated lessons in Proverbs involves being wise with words, because there is a wise way and a foolish way to use them. So today, let's talk about three lessons we can learn from Proverbs about words. The first lesson seems like the most obvious. Words are true or false. In Proverbs 12, we read, The Lord detests lying lips, but He delights in men who are truthful. That makes sense, right? We could just say it, acknowledge it, and move on, except that you know and I both know that the truth can be elusive. With the invention of the internet and access to limitless information and sources, shouldn't truth be easier to identify and find? And sadly, that's not the reality at all. Instead, falsehood spreads as easily as truth these days. Now anyone can come to an argument, not just with their own opinions, but with their own digitally sourced facts. But let's make it more personal. Have you ever noticed how bad little kids are at lying? You'll ask a toddler, did you take a cupcake? And they'll say no. And then you'll say, well, that's strange because you are currently holding a cupcake in your hand. See, they're so bad at lying, but guess what? They get better. And eventually, this bad habit of our childhood becomes the character flaw of our adulthood. It's embarrassing to confess, but I'm guilty of this. I've told the white lie, the version of the story that was most convenient for me, the version of the story that made me look good. I've gossiped about another person and then backpedaled when word got back to them. And if you called me a liar, I'd be offended. I would defend my character. But if you ask me if I ever use false words, the only way I could emphatically say no is if I lied to you. Let's be real about lies. They're an attempt to control another person with information. There are no white lies or versions of the truth. These are tools of manipulation. They're attempts to control another person's thoughts or actions or responses. And the writer of the proverb reminds us that our Father in heaven knows the difference between true and false words and that he detests lying lips. Choosing truthful words isn't just good for your character and integrity. It's also the wise way to communicate. But guess what the other problem is with false words? Eventually, the truth comes out. As Proverbs says, an evil man is trapped by his sinful talk, but a righteous man escapes trouble. When we tell lies, we open ourselves up to get trapped. I have a friend who is a polygraph examiner for the government. I asked him if it was possible to beat a lie detector test because, well, you never know. He told me it wasn't about beating the machine. It was about beating the technician. His technique is what makes the test work. He asks large numbers of seemingly mundane questions, and then he moves on to asking different questions or different versions of that same question over and over. And the result is that if a person's telling lies, eventually they paint themselves in a corner with their own inconsistencies. So yes, the machine is reading how their body is responding to the questions, and he's gaining a little insight from it. But he said it's not the machine that traps them, it's their own words. Falsehoods trap us and become our prison. The more falsehood we speak, the tighter we're confined, the more painful that prison becomes. Friends, there is freedom in not having to remember what you said before. There is freedom in not fearing that the truth ever comes out. And what's more, God delights in the truth. The truth matters to Him. Words are true or false, and the wise way tells the truth. And when we slip up and speak falsehood, the wise way means going back to correct and set the record straight. So first, words are true or false. And second, words can heal or hurt. The writer of the Proverbs puts it this way. There's one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The foolish way is to use our words to hurt. 
These words are described as rash. They're thoughtless words that just burst out of us, often without any consideration of how they might wound. And they do wound. The writer of the Proverbs compares them to sword thrusts. They violently pierce a person's being, often damaging their heart. We've all walked in the foolish way, haven't we? Ironically, we're most prone to do this with the people we love the most, those we have the most power to wound. Let me ask you this. Have you ever said something awful and then thought to yourself, where did that come from? Well, Jesus has something to say about that. In the Gospel of Matthew, he insightfully points out, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What comes out of our mouth reveals the state of our hearts. So if we find ourselves in regular cycles, speaking rash and hateful words, there's something that needs to be addressed inside of us. After all, hurt people hurt people, right? The wounds our words inflict on others reflect our own wounded hearts. And if we want to walk in the wise way, we have to address the poison infecting our own hearts first. When we find ourselves hurting others, this doesn't necessarily make us bad people. It simply reveals that we're hurt people. And what we need is emotional or physical or spiritual healing. And healing can come from doctors or therapists or pastors, friends and family, but it's also through the power of the great physician and the mighty counselor, the Holy Spirit. And when our own hearts heal, we can walk in the wise way to bring healing to others. For as the proverb reminds us, the tongue of the wise brings healing. The word for healing here is in the original Hebrew is also the root word uh, for soft. Essentially, it tells us the wise way involves speaking soft, gentle words to one another. So let's take a moment right now. Reflect on your use of words. What results are they producing? Are they rash and wounding like sharp sword thrusts? Or gentle and restorative like a balm of healing? If you're unsure, ask those closest to you, the ones you love and who love you the most. If you want to grow in the wise way with your words, practice this. What if for seven days we held our tongues anytime we felt the urge to criticize someone? Just ask the Holy Spirit to prick your conscience anytime you're on the verge of speaking those critical, hurtful words. Let's practice holding our tongues. Let's strengthen our self-control muscles. What could change in your life if you experience breakthrough in this area? Words can heal or they can hurt. And the wise way is using words to heal. So words are true or false. Words can hurt or heal. And finally, words bring life or death. The writer of the Proverbs reminds us, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. See, here the writer of Proverbs reminds us that we will eat the fruit of our words, because not only are words powerful, they also have consequences. Words grow beautiful friendships, or end them. Words build trust among work colleagues, or cause division. Words deepen family relationships, or destroy them. Our ability to communicate is one of our most important tools, and how we use it often determines whether we speak life or speak death over our relationships. Recently, there was a, a YouTube video about an art project created by a high school student from Chicago. And she told her classmates her goal was to take two photographs of them, a before and an after shot, if you will. She didn't want the people to pose. She wanted their most natural and honest looks. Now, what she didn't tell them was that she was actually running video to capture the whole exchange. And one after another, her schoolmate stepped in front of the rolling camera, again, with no knowledge of what she was doing. And with each person standing in place, she would say the same line. In this project, I'm taking pictures of things I think are beautiful. Every face changed instantly. Most smiled. Some were surprised. Many faces reflected feeling seen and affirmed. A few immediately left the camera frame to hug the compliment giver because they were unable to contain their happiness. But not all of them. Some looked away, embarrassed. Some looked suspicious to have received the compliment almost as if they didn't believe they were beautiful, so the compliment sounded patronizing. Maybe at some point, someone called them ugly and their words lodged tightly in their heart. Or maybe they'd called themselves ugly so many times that any other suggestion just had to be untrue. 
Looking at the comments below the video, one particular thread was a heartbreaker. Someone wrote, I have never been called beautiful in my entire life by anyone. But then a second random person replied, that ends today. You really are beautiful. See, the tongue has the power of life or death. The wise way to use our words is to speak life. So here's another challenge for you. For the next seven days, intentionally speak life-giving words to people in your life. Each day, tell someone about what you appreciate about them. Affirm things that they're good at in their job or at school or in their relationships. And if they seem sad or discouraged, ask the Holy Spirit to give you words to be a healing balm to their soul. The wise way to use our words is to bring life. I want to do that for the people I love, don't you? Friends, for better or for worse, our words create worlds. And learning to harness the wisdom of our words is vital for our lives, for our families, for our cities, for our world, because words have power to create clarity or sow confusion, to build up or to destroy, to uplift or to crush. And to be clear, the conversation today isn't a rebuke for the time that we've been careless with our words. It's an invitation into a wiser way of living. As we wrap this up, I'd like for you to close your eyes and relax. Still your mind, breathe, In the quietness of this moment, think back over the last 24 hours of your life. Who did you encounter? What conversations did you have with people? Are there any conversations sticking out to you? Ask the Holy Spirit to bring one in particular to mind. As you recall that conversation, remembering the time and place, the emotions you felt as you spoke, imagine the person on the receiving side of your words. Replay the exchange in your mind. Were there life-giving words that you spoke? Did you use any words that sow seeds of death? Okay, you can open your eyes. Words create worlds. So if God brought to mind any words that weren't true, or that weren't healing, or weren't life-giving, recognize that you have a choice today to change direction. When a wise person speaks, it's true. When a wise person speaks, it is healing and comforting to wounded souls. When a wise person speaks, it is life-giving. So let's be wise people and choose our words carefully because the God of wisdom has words that he says about you. And perhaps these are words that you need to hear in order to heal today. God says, you are beloved. You are precious in my sight. You are created for a purpose. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are forgiven. You are not defined by your past mistakes. You are worth more than gold. You are a child of God. And he says, I am with you always. Shortly before he went to the cross, Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. As we prepare to receive communion, let's embrace this intimate relationship with Jesus, recognizing that we are not merely his followers, but cherished friends who are entrusted with his divine wisdom. Let this moment of communion be a celebration of this friendship, a time to deepen our connection with Jesus and with each other as the body of Christ. Through the bread and the cup, we remember his sacrifice and renew our commitment to live out his teachings. I just want to speak
So we declare over you, may his favor be upon you and the thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and the thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. Come on. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you. Join Jesus, our friend, as we receive the bread, his body broken for us. The cup, his blood shed for us. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I pray over everybody who is joining us online today. I pray for the people that they're gonna interact with this week, that this message would just change their perspective and attitude as they go about their lives, that you would allow for just moments where they can point people back to you through their words, that this would be an opportunity for them to share who you are through what you've done in their lives, God, but that they would be able to speak in wisdom, kindness, and that there would be healing in our words. Thank you for our time of gathering today. In your name we pray, amen. I'm so glad you were able to join us today. As always, be sure to head to communitychristian.info to find out about everything that's happening this week at Community. And we'll see you right here next time at Community Online.